told Lauren Chang I was going to have a very long introduction. <laughs> um, so my name is Judy Wu, and I teach the class that's, that's in this room. It's Chinese American Experience. I'm also chair of Asian American Studies. And this talk is part of our, um, our celebration this year. Asian American Studies is 25 years old. And we're celebrating that in conjunction with the Southeast Asian Archives, which is turning 30. And if people have not had a chance to go over there, I would highly recommend it. It's an incredible set of resources. Um, they collect materials about Southeast Asian American communities or Southeast Asian communities, high school communities, that were dislocated as a result of war in Southeast Asia. In the spring time, you're going to have an art exhibit that features the works that were created by refugees when they were in refugee camps about their conditions and their, their aspirations and their hopes. So um, scholars from around the world come just to visit, and I hope you'll have a chance to go over there and, and be exposed to that. Um, we chose the theme of homescapes, warscapes, <coughs> as a way to think about the connections that we have um, as Asian Americans, as Southeast Asian Americans. We wanted to highlight the process of dislocation and the search for home or creation of homes and communities. And we also wanted to foreground how war and militarism forces that process of dislocation and forces that, that process of, of new community formation. Um, I really want to thank our co-sponsors today to enable us to bring Professor Gordon Chang here. And they are um, the Department of History, and I actually want to recognize um, Jeff Osterstrom, who's my co-organizer today. Um, and I also really want to thank the Long Institute, Long um, U.S. China Institute from the law school, and you know, Christine Chow is here. Um, and also I want to thank the Center for Asian Studies, as well as Access Asia, which Matt very <laughs> innately um, coordinates. And he was so generous. There was another talk at the same time, and he actually switched the time of the other talk for, the, for us not to have a time conflict. So, I'm very grateful for that, that act of generosity. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how international conflicts and um, tensions have a, have a profound impact on Chinese Americans. And I just want to share this, this letter that was written by a New York Times editor by Michael Wuo. And it's entitled, An Open Letter to the Women Who Told My Family to Go Back to China. So this is just posted on Sunday. And even though it's a little bit lengthy, I just want to read this to you. It's not the whole thing. I excerpted it. And so, dear madam, maybe I should have let it go. Turn the other cheek. We had just gone down to church. I was with my family and some friends on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. We were going to lunch, trying to see if there was room in the Korean restaurant down the street. You were in a rush. It was rainy. Our stroller and a gaggle of Asians were in your way. But I was honestly stunned when you yelled at us from down the block, go back to China. I hesitated for a second and then sprinted to confront you. That must have startled you. Pulled out your iPhone in front of the Equinox and threatened to call the cops. It was comical in retrospect. You might have been charged instead, especially after I walked away and you streamed, go back to your fucking country. I was born in this country, I yelled back. It felt silly, but how else to prove I belonged? This was not my first encounter, of course, with racist insults. Ask any Asian American and they'll readily summon memories of schoolyard taunts or disturbing encounters on the street or at the grocery store. But for some reason, and yes, it probably had to do with the political climate right now, this time felt different. Walking home later, a pang of sadness welled up inside me. You had on a nice raincoat, your iPhone was a 6 plus. You could have been a fellow parent in one of my daughter's schools. You seemed, well, normal. But you had all these feelings in you. And the reality is, so do a lot of people in this country right now. Maybe you don't know this, but the insults you hurled at my family get to the heart of the Asian American experience. It's this persistent sense of otherness that a lot of us struggle with every day. That no matter how well we do, how successful we are, and he's Harvard educated, he's an editor at the New York Times, what friends we make, we don't belong. We're foreign, we're not American. And I wonder if that feeling will ever go away. Perhaps most important, I wonder whether my two daughters who are with me today will always feel that way too. So I want to share this very, I think, very profound and moving experience that in some ways is mundane, but also tremendously painful and has a huge impact on people who are of Asian ancestry in the United States. And I'm hoping that the talk and our subsequent conversation will, will connect these various themes of international diplomacy um, with the lived experience of being in the United States. So I want to introduce um, our guest speaker. It's a great pleasure for me to do so. Um, Professor Gordon Chang is Professor of American History, the Olive H. Palmer Professor in Humanities, and the Director of the Center for East Asian Studies at Stanford University. He was also my graduate advisor, and I was his first PhD student. Um, <laughs> um, 
In addition, when I was an undergraduate at Stanford University, that's when I first gained exposure to the field of Asian American studies. And I participated in the political movement to demand that the university hire its first appointment in Asian American studies. And as an undergraduate, I served on the search committee that ended up hiring Gordon Chang, along with David Palumbo Liu. Gordon Chang is the author of, and the editor of seven books. I think I counted correctly, seven. <laughs> Let's <laughs> talk after two or three. Um, and the topics have an impressive range. Um, his first work was looking at the U.S. Soviet Union China relations. He subsequently published on Asian American art, Asian American politics, Japanese American identity and internment, South Asian American culture and intellectual history. And his most recent work is with State Harvard University. It's entitled Fateful Ties, A History of America's Preoccupation with China. And his talk will be drawn from that. I also want to mention an additional project that he's working on, actually with Professor Yan Chen, who's in the back. Um, and it seeks to document the lives and the engineering achievements of Chinese railroad workers, who not only built the railroads here in the United States, but who then subsequently built railroads in South Africa, Australia, and around the world. So hopefully we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about that as well. So please join me today in welcoming Professor Yan Chen. Thank you, Professor Wu. <laughs> wonderful to be able to say that here at Irvine. And thank you for all for coming out. And uh, I want to specifically thank four or five institutions that are hosting. Uh, I lost track of all of them. So thank you, institutions at UC Irvine, for uh, providing this opportunity for me to come down to a, a place uh, I'm very fond of. And it's great to see colleagues from the history department that uh, I've had long associations with. And I mean, I know they actually, Professor Wu left this out, that she was on the search committee that brought me to Stanford. But the place I came from was UC Irvine. <laughs> and I was here, and that last time I was here was, I think, 95 or 96, you know, I forgot which year. A long I, time ago. <laughs> long time ago, 20 years ago, before most of you were born. <laughs> but I was sort of uh, um, in between Stanford and Irvine at that time. You know, I have very fond memories. So many in Nikki, this class, which uh, is heartening for one who has been involved with Asian American studies uh, basically my whole adult life. Uh, and this is a kind of a passion, uh, both personally as well as intellectually. Um, very, uh, I don't have a lot of time, and the talk is much longer than about the half hour or so, and I'll, I will speak, and I'll try to be to that, because I don't know like to have this time for, for discussion. So in a, in, a, in, a, in a kernel here, the, the argument of this talk and this book in which I draw and will speak about is that uh, America has had a peculiar and particular place in the formation of what we'll say an American identity. And that this American identity has long been, or Americans have long been, I say Americans, preceding United States, from the very beginning of the founding of the colonies, that China was an important ingredient, an element in the, in the thinking of many Americans, both as a, plan, a place of uh, opportunity and fortune, as well as a place of dread and fear. <coughs> and if that sounds familiar, it's deliberately so, because what I'm talking about now is sort of a history of the present. And that what may sound familiar to you now has a long genealogy, has a long history, has begins from Jamestown. And even before Jamestown, it begins with, in a sense, Christopher Columbus, which we'll get to in a moment. So this is connected. This is on a realm of international relations, trans-Pacific relations, but also involved very much Asian American history, Chinese American history, because I think as you all know or are sensitive about that what happens internationally affects us here at home. And the relationship of great powers has profound effect and profound influence on the people uh, uh, related to those uh, countries. Uh, certainly Japanese Americans, we all know about that in World War II. So that, that in a sense, is, is a simple way of putting forward this argument that this history is about international relations, but also very much about domestic, ethnic, and race relations. Now, um, uh, I'm also, right now, my current project is a co-director of an international project 
on covering and interpreting the experience of China's railroad workers in North America. Uh, we're centered at Stanford, and this project is properly housed at Stanford. I say properly because Leland Stanford, the benefactor of Stanford University, got rich from the labor of the anywhere from 15 to 25,000 Chinese workers who labored on the western portion of the tra first transcontinental railroad, who helped build substantially the railroad from Sacramento to Salt Lake City. And their contribution, their work, their experience, and attendant issues around this experience has never been adequately or very much studied. And we want to change that. And particularly, we want to do this at Stanford because we are the direct benefactors uh, and uh, of their uh, of this uh, labor and the Stanford University only as late as April of this year formally and officially acknowledged the source of the wealth of the Stanfords. And so, so we were we welcome that at our academic conference when one of the deans came forward and said that. So this is our website. I wish I had time to talk about it. Maybe another occasion I'll come down and we can talk about railroad work. It's, it's a, Railroads, I really become a railroad buff. Your railroads are <laughs> fascinating <laughs> and, and institutions and experiences. It's, it really changed the world. And, and one can say that before and after the railroad, you know, the world was different before and after the railroad, just as the world was different before and after the internet. So the two great infrastructure developments. But that's another discussion. Uh, these are, we're looking at photographs, we're trying to find documents, we're talking to ancestors, descendants of ancestors, Chinese railroad workers, and uh, to understand their lived experience, their actual, uh, which need to find out how many there were, or how many died, and how, how did they need, how, how, where did they need, where did they go, after all the other kind of basic questions, and what kind of skill do they bring to building this railroad. And, and we have very little, we have meager documentary evidence, because so much of the record uh, is lost, uh, and destroyed over time. But we're looking at newspapers such as this. Is, this is the East Side of the American, and um, this is this is. You can read something like this, and again, it talks. It sounds like the present of you know, how some people valorize Asian workers. Uh, this is the same type of attitude. Now, we can talk about this too. You know, whether this accords with some type of reality or this is a perception. Or what we know, what is it? What is it? But the idea of Chinese as being degraded and, and oppressed and suppressed and insulted, yes, that's true, but they're also profound and, and, and uh, uh, appreciated as laborers, as workers, as people who now generate the wealth of uh, much of uh, the most portion of the US. But this is, uh, these are great photos you can see. They, they, these were, you can tell the Chinese, you can't see the features because they got their sun hats from southern China, from the Pearl River Delta. As you can see, they even wear them here in the winter. And I always ask myself, my family, my ancestry is from southern China, from the Pearl River Delta, my mother's side, the fourth generation, from this very region near Macau, near Hong Kong. And I always, when I ever go up to Tahoe and in the winter, I said, what the hell were these guys doing up there? <laughs> well, here they are. Like, there these are farmers from tropical southern China who did rice and you know all, all that. And now here they are building tunnels using dynamite and so it's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's an incredible story. Uh, well, that's part of the story of U.S.-China relations. It's a, and this book is not a political history. It's not a diplomatic history. Some of you are political scientists there. I've done political history before. And this is my first book, which <laughs> Professor Wu mentioned, which is a, high, is a study of high-level thinking about a geopolitical relationship of the Soviet Union, the United States, and China. I wanted to know the history of the so-called triangular relationship between these powers, and in particular, what was the American stance toward monolithic communism? Did the United States, the American policymakers, from Truman uh, on, uh, think of that the Soviet Union and China were really tight allies against the West, or did they have other attitudes to understand the differences among communists and communists? The book it still has relevance today. It's still being used, and it, it, it picked up again in China. So again, because there have been several translations of it in China, and this just came out about two years ago. The new translations, so those of you who know Chinese, you know, it's interesting to give it a different title than mm -hmm. English title. The English title is a bit more uh, fluid. It goes back to friends and enemies, and you know, which is who, what is who, when. 
whether this is are you friend or are you an enemy? Are you friend or enemy? Are you either one or the other? This is more of a part of the uh, But I've also been interested in Asian American history for say, I don't know, this is a book that you have been introduced to it in this class, but this is a collection of primary uh, voices, diary entries, speeches, essays, op ed pieces like this piece that Professor Wu just mentioned. Uh, uh, written by Chinese about their experience in America from the recent past. And also, I've been very interested in cultural history. So, what these show is my interest in moving away from political history, that is, the history of, of, of officials and official thought, to looking at more of the intellectual, cultural, milieu context of international relations. And Right, the Eisenhower it was an American, it was a president, but it was also just a person who lived in that time and place and inherited the history he did. And so therefore this milieu, this content, intellectual cultural context, is essential to understand of how he also to be able to explain why he took different policies in the United States. All right, so let's get into oh <laughs> <laughs> do you sure you put the right I think Professor Wu is kind of undermined. <laughs> <laughs> Who are these people? <laughs> Who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> Who's this? Yeah, what she's wearing. Someone says walking egg omelet. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was designed by Chinese designer. Uh, I had to throw a guy in. You know, gender equality here. Justin with dragons. Always the dragon. It's Sarah Jessica Parker looking very unsexy here. <laughs> and sitting so got her hair's on fire or something. I suppose it's Buddhist. Or, I don't know what's going on. Some adaptation of, from Asian uh, dress without jewels. I get the joke. No, <laughs> Kim Kardashian oh. <laughs> showing a lot of stuff, but no jewels here. You know, he was supposed to got all the jewels taken from her Paris and Kate Hudson. So. As you might see, well, what's, what's the connection to all these? They're all supposedly gals or costumes inspired by Chinese fashion from roughly the later period, from the 18th, 19th century to the present. And that this is the red carpet where the celebrities are coming to the, what's called the, the gala of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, the biggest museum probably in certainly the United States. And every year they have a gala, and they had, this was the opening show opening event for their blockbuster show about the influence showing Western fashion. This is an art museum now, you know, this is when they show gowns and costumes from Hollywood and so forth that is supposedly inspired or influenced by Chinese idioms, art, and fashion in particular. And then they've all the they go out to show off these designer gowns to measure greater success. <laughs> but this this is part of the present moment that I speak about in the book. And they gave a very interesting title. So I think China through the looking glass, and the looking glass is sort of ambiguous. What does that mean? What? How can you? How do you see something through a looking glass? A looking glass is a mirror, right? But you start looking through it, you're sort of disoriented to the Alice in Wonderland. Uh, but it's also a reflection. And I think the idea is that this is an effort to try to re understand us, American fashion, American taste. Uh, as how it has been influenced by an unusual source by Chinese uh, art and culture. And this sort of symbolizes this interest where you have what appears to be a Ming, Ming Dynasty blue and white boss, but it's really a dress. And so that goes on and on. But that, so this is part of this per, per, current moment when I say there's lots of interest in Chinese culture, from pandas to all sorts of things. Well, there are other dimensions of this now, up to the present moment. And this is another dimension, and that's the business relationship, of course. And I can hear that, about that a lot. This is in, and some of you have been here in Shanghai, at the, just before the opening of the 
flagship store in Shanghai and the new business district in Shanghai. You can see some pictures of buildings here. Um, and I thought it was a neat photo. It's kind of eerie and beautiful. It evokes to me sort of Aya Pei's crystal pyramid in the Louvre, and you have to go in and go down into the museum. But here you have Apple, the uh, <laughs> biggest, I think it's the biggest now capitalized company in the world with the sort of hologram up here and in China, and people waiting to get in the next day to go to the open of the store. And some of you have been in China or from China know that Apple products are really big, and there's a cachet of Apple name uh, in China. So Apple products, which you have every, all over the place, <laughs> I mean, these are from southern China, probably. Somebody of the 700,000 Chinese workers, 700,000 workers produce these for Apple in China. And so we, we buy these things uh, for ourselves. And Chinese are too. And Tim Cook said, uh, not addressing the manufacturing issue, but he said very soon, he said, the sky's the limit for Apple. The sky's the limit uh, in China. And very soon, Apple will have make more revenue in China than anywhere else in the world, including the United States. It's huge. The idea of the, the inexhaustible, the expanse expansive the China market. 1.3 billion people. By the United States, it's about you know, 330, 340 million or something like that. It's four times the size of the United States of uh, consumers. And in, in already last year, Apple sold more products in China than the rest of the world combined. And only in the United States did Apple sell more or have greater revenue than in China. Uh, not just Apple, but uh, Warren Buffett is Bill Gates, two, number one and number two billion, seventy or sixty billion dollars each. They're worth or something. I mean, they can't unfathomable amount of money, but they're both very high. They're bullish on China, and they talk very, I think, uh, in very sincere ways about their. This was a few years ago about China's economic uh, development, and, and they, they certainly see great opportunities there, but also believe as businessmen that this is a historic, and I do agree, this is a historic transformation of China that China's gone through the past 30 years. The economic, just look at the economics, taking anything else aside, when you have four or five hundred million people come out of what was considered to be poverty to now, it's much more stable and clearly elevated standard. I mean, this is unprecedented human history. And this is what these guys were talking about, in addition to the business possibilities. Uh, and then just this past summer, the opening of Shanghai Disney, a joint venture, which uh, costs, which is an investment of approximately six billion dollars. That's a big Disneyland, <laughs> just off the street. And there are Disneyland's in Paris, and Tokyo, and Hong Kong. I don't think there's another forum, but, but this is going to be the biggest international one. It's already been a huge success. I don't know if anybody's been there. I've talked to some. It's already packed with people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Opening week, it was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd mean, love to hear your, your impressions of it. I haven't seen it. You know, you have Chinese Mickey Mouse, and, uh, <laughs> you know, the fast food stuff. It's all different. So I, I, I mean, really, it's an intercultural phenomena. Is Disney taking over China? You know, is Disney Disneyfying China with all the cultural values we all kind of laugh about Disney here? Is that the same thing that happened in China? Or is China taking over Disney? I mean, it's sort of both. So this is this is the intertwining of these two countries. And here you have Professor, dare I say that? Word? Oh, no. uh, our guy here in no. Irvine, Professor Navarro, who uh, has written repeatedly or told two books here uh, about the China threat. And this is the downside. It's the negative side of the now. You know, not just the positive side, but the downside, the danger, the fear, the threat, the hostility, the suspicion. That is probably quite dominant now, certainly in the public mind. Uh, you have seen books such as I just pulled this off of the internet. This, I put this together a few a couple of years ago, even before I came to Google was, certainly before he signed on with Trump. But, uh, but <laughs> I put this together and, and loaded, and I put this together and I, I'm looking at it, and all of a sudden I realized they've all got dragons yeah. on them, you know, <laughs> snarling dragons. You know, like this, 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 and they all basically say the same thing. Use sort of similar sort of evidence. Except the middle book is better. When China rules the world, a terrible time, I think, but it's interesting. 
Series book. And then there's some other type of things. And in many ways, I probably like this title the best, Unbalanced to Go to Spence. <laughs> is that the two are so emotionally fraught and mixed up with each other in institutional and emotional, cultural, social ways that we're sort of dependent upon each other. Who's more dependent on each other? Both dependent on each other. Now, which I think is a more uh, interesting way of thinking about it. So, uh, and then the current moment here, I threw Donald in, and in, in most of you are probably spared by having to see him online where he talks about China, 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 and how he goes on, and how China is responsible for everything, although he finds some good things in China, such as China built, a great, they built the Great Wall in, in China, and are there any Mexicans in China? He, he, said, he said that. <laughs> You know, I'm not making it up. Not, you know, China built the Great Wall, and there are no Mexicans there. Uh, so this, but he also the Great Global Warming. He says, you know, created by China. So everything sort of gets dumped on China bashing, if you will. Now clearly there are a lot of issues with China. There are problems in the relationship. But the way that the Trump did is it echoes, it reverberates, it draws from a long history of China fear of China, and which is parallel. Simultaneous as to the traction of China. Now, this goes back, and here I'm going to go through history more quickly and get through through some of this events. And so you'll have to go buy the book, please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get any, I don't, you know, we don't, we don't, we don't make any money from the books. Very little money. We can go buy a cup of coffee or something. <laughs> we don't make the academic books. Thank you very much. But, uh, so the argument of the book is that I look at different, I talk about 350 years of history in a few hundred pages. How do you do that? And it sort of is that side. It is sort of taking different moments in history. Now, and so I try to suggest that these are important and they're suggested not just of that specific moment, not the specific history, but as something wider and bigger. And you put them all together, it means a big, it means something big. And that's what I've tried to do at, in this long circle. Sort of the development for the historians that try to try to, to, to create uh, a, mentality, a mentality, an intellectual approach, a cultural, social approach uh, to a history, a very long, and that just as much as the uh, uh, World Bank is an institution, so are structures of thought. But we can't see them. So how do we see them? Well, actually, they're right there. They're a history. And so we look at things like this with the Boston Tea Party, which is all know have gone through American high schools where these white guys dressed up as Indians and they would attack these ships that are laden with tea and throw them overboard as a protest for the despotism of the king, of the original of King George, uh, George III, and for the gre and to protest the grievance of no taxation without representation. We all know that who what is being taxed among many things? It's the tea. And Americans don't like that as issue of principle, but also it means more to go out and have a morning tea and needs more money. And this is just wrong. It's no taxation without representation. And where is the tea from? Did anyone ever stop and think about that when you had you in high school and you read about this? Did you ever think about where is this tea from? Did anyone ever do that? I mean, I don't think I did. You know, it's just tea. It just happened to be a well, it comes from, uh, from southern China. I was going to try to remember who was from, from where. Group. This is probably akin to the lousy Chinese tea we get in Chinese restaurants, like in China <laughs> You know, oolong tea, which is pretty pedestrian the way we get it here. It can be very good. But at that time, this was a very pretty inexpensive tea. It could have been expensive tea, but probably not because it took a long time to get over from China, and the best teas don't, and they perish, and they degrade pretty quickly. So this is some type of oolong tea, probably. And so China is embedded in the midst of this real <coughs> epic political moment. And, uh, and tea itself was a valuable commodity in America at the time. After the revolution itself, China appears again. This, this illustration I have here of a painting done many years after, 1784, February 22nd, George Washington's birthday, coincidentally, depicting actual departure of two ships from New York Harbor that had been trapped there because of the ice flows. And this is the first ship flying the new, very prominent display, Stars and Stripes. 
stars and stripes did not exist before, before the revolution, right? Because this is now the American flag. You went this flag of the United States of America. And this is the Empress of China. The first ship that leaves an American port to go to a foreign port. Empress of China, American port. That now initiates the U.S.-China trade. The America-China trade precedes it, uh, as I've been suggested before. Behind it, interesting, in this picture, which is actually true in history, is another ship that's leaving for a different port, London. And this ship has on board the ratified Treaty of Paris, which was the peace treaty signed between the American, former American colonists and now independent Americans and the Crown. And this is the settlement of the conflict and granting Ameri the colonies independence. It's a really valuable, very important document. But it follows this ship, this mercantile effort in this picture and in actual history. But what, what do you think might be on this ship? Americans are buying tons of China stuff. Chinaware, houseware, furniture, wallpaper, tea, lots of stuff. China was the Ikea of this southern China. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really well. I mean, it, it, I think it's an interesting political eco economic question, which I keep posing to people. I hope people will help me understand. Is, is the long continue, how did Chinese business people you know, develop a sense of business that just flowers in these past 30 years? And that there's many connections one can make with how Chinese do business, I think, how Chinese business do business today, with going even going back 200 years. There are certain methods of, of personal relationships, understandings of, of that, many of them. But, so the Americans had been selling and buying lots of stuff from China, but they didn't have much problem, much success in selling from Chinese money, just as the British had, that's what we to the open war and all this. But what do you think was on this ship? What do you think Americans thought Chinese would buy to balance the so-called balance the trade? And just guesses. Sir. Sure. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> tobacco is a good guess, but no, the tobacco industry is very small. Rice, very much. Rice. <laughs> <laughs> the Americans do start to grow rice later on, particularly down Georgia, the areas, and bring it in. And, and, uh, Another sideline, I had a student undergraduate a few years ago, took a job with me. And she, what she did was to go through and look at uh, the search online of American um, towns that had Chinese names. Oh. And in Georgia, there's like a Canton, Georgia. <laughs> there's Canton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. You know, Can it's Canton, Ohio. It's Canton, the National Baseball Museum in Canton, Ohio. That's Canton. And there's like a Peking, Nebraska. <laughs> and so she found like 30 of these in a fairly easy search. And she went back and looked at these. A lot of these towns got their names in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, up to 1850s, where these different towns hope to have something uh, auspicious to name themselves as they try to become important cities. And in Georgia, this place tried to grow silk. So like naming itself, they can't, whatever the city is. I don't think it's Shanghai. Shanghai comes along later on. But you know, Canton, they, Peking, uh, where the more appropriate, interesting common names. And they're still there called it called that today. Um, but this had on board ginseng. Like taking coal to Newcastle. You know? <laughs> You'd think. That is why take ginseng to China, which you grow a lot of uh, Korea and China grow a lot of ginseng and very well, ginseng grows in the wilds of uh, Adirondacks and all the whole way to Wisconsin and southern Canada. And it was used as a medicinal by native peoples. Uh, the French learned that also from native peoples. And so they had been gathering this for some time. And the American merchant contracted with native peoples to gather tons of this stuff. 30 tons of this was on the Empress of China. This is a photo I took in San Francisco, Chinatown, a couple of years ago. Well, quickly, as I said, a lot of the wealthy money, the wealth money of early America was founded on two great, on two pillars of the, econ of the economy, the slave, African slave trade and the China trade. And in the Northeast, it was the China trade. Americans at the time did not produce a lot of things that other people wanted. Later on, it would be timber, tobacco, cotton, of course, agricultural products. 
but at the early time, it was furs. And some people talk about furs and pelts. And they were, uh, Americans did sell them. Again, from native peoples, Canadians, uh, and they were sent to China. Chinese like them, particularly beaver and, uh, and otter. And later on, otter pelts, sea otters, which was all the California pelts. So Robert Bennett Forbes was a money trader, John Jacob Astor, an early sort of Trump person. He was a, a real estate developer. Man, he was the first big developer of Manhattan, and that's why they have these hotels named after you know, the Waldorf Astoria, or Astoria, is it Oregon or Washington? I always forget. It's at the mouth of the Columbia River. It, it was the first American, permanent American settlement on the West Coast, set up by John Jacob Astor to be a trading entrepot for uh, his hopefully fur uh, trade with, with China. And the Columbia River, I don't know anybody's a wide, massive river that goes eastward, and some people thought that that would be the way uh, the so-called famous Northwest Passage, and one could take a water route all the way through uh, North America. Uh, and other names, and you come from the Boston area, New England, all the Blue Blend names, the buildings at Harvard, and, and are all named after these people, and even presidents have their names, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and, and his mother's side was a Delano, and he was, a, his whole family were old China traders and Franklin Roosevelt was very keen and fond of the family's connection with China. Which some people suggest might have been some of his reason for his, his attachment to, to China in World War II and his interest in China way beyond what some people believe were sort of the, the interest of the United States at the time. Well, Leland Stanford here in this painting um, helped bring in the Chinese as workers and benefited enriched himself from their work. But this, again, as I said today, there's the downside. And this was the anti-Chinese movement, the xenophobia, the racism, that went rampant roughly from the 1850s you know, for the next almost 100 years uh, that uh, uh, resulted in the Chinese Exclusion Act, Restriction Act, to which you know about. But this magazine cover illustrates this racist view of a diabolic being, I wouldn't call it human, and it's just devilish figure here. Um, can't quite figure out how they came, came up with this nightmaric vision of, of, of theft, of intimidation, of robbery, uh, of degrading women, of making cigars, Chinese were making cigars in San Francisco, and taking jobs away, bringing dope in, and this type of stuff. And this is this is this fear of the yellow peril which you can see even openly talked about in books such as this, a um, history book or a book at the time during the Boxer Rebellion. It sounds like China is now is warring with the rest of the world, but when, at the time when the rest of the Western world, the United States and Japan were invading China um, to put to help suppress the Boxers. But this famous tract here, which I don't know we used in our <laughs> it, it, it's as inexhaustible possibilities of interpreting this so it's so dense of racism and racist analogies and metaphors and arguments it's it's really quite uh, interesting and in, in stomach something but it's just by the title alone it gives you some sense of what the ways they might be understood and what it tells us about people's attitudes at the time well all's not so ugly there are other dimensions including the missionaries which I talk too much about these are there were more American evangelical missionaries in China than any other nationality, foreign nationality. They ardently believed that the second coming of Christ could happen and would happen only if China was made Christian or a good portion of it, which was what attracted so many of them to go evangelical uh, in their evangelical work there. Um, this is John Layton Stewart, the most famous American missionary in China. He was the son of missionaries. They had, his parents had arrived in China in the mid-19th century. He'd been born there. He spent 50 years of his life in China and uh, became the founder of what's called uh, Yin, uh, Yinqing University, which is on the outskirts of Peking. And his campus, he developed a very beautiful campus, and uh, after 1949, the campus was taken over. Yenching itself was a 
consolidation of five, six, or seven Christian, American Christian colleges in the area, and they went under his leadership, became very successful over a few decades to build a great institution. And that institution campus and much of the structure of it, the school itself, is now known as Peking University. And he brought in lots of American money to build buildings, which are still there, and including the well-known water tower on the lake of Peking. Some of you know, know about this. And even your, your university. I, That's I, what I was going to say. I graduated in there during my master program. And you're made up at Peking University. But also, uh, oh, yeah, tower. Uh, yeah, water tower. So do you know who built, uh, who, who, where the money come from for this? <laughs> no, no, he was, he was, no, he got the money. But if you go down here, right around here, in the, in the weeds, in the, in the, in the uh, ivy weeds over here, you can see a plaque. And it says that this was money from the president of Alcoa Aluminum. And your, your campus, uh, San Sen University, uh, was originally a Christian university, American Christian university. And the, down, and the main campus, the administration building, very pretty building, I think. A very interesting sort of missionary education, American Jeffersonian revival sort of, I don't know how this is done. Uh, and so almost every university, major university today, the Jung University, the Tsinghua University, all, University, all of them were founded originally by American missionary educators. Well, during World War II, we talked about the close relationship against a common enemy, and people thought the two were going to build a new democratic Asia after the World War II. That doesn't happen, of course, in China has a communist revolution, and Time magazine uh, vilifies uh, the communist leader Mao here. Time magazine the publisher itself had been brought up in China itself. And they lose the things. Loose family, some of you have got money from the Loose Foundation. That's money. You got money from the Loose Foundation? Yeah. The Loose Foundation yeah. was, is, is uh, very generous and very interested in supporting the research and engagement. They, 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 uh, they were quite conservative uh, during their lifetime, and their, their legacy has been very helpful. But Henry Loose was adamantly anti communist very supportive the nationalist and editorialized through his magazine, which included Time, Life, Fortune, Cosmopolitan, Sports Illustrated, it goes on and on. And the Loose Fair, Loose name is, was, Loose was probably one of the most powerful uh, publishers in the uh, 20th century uh, space. But here is this image that it symbolizes the new attitude towards China, now it's communist China, the Red Horde, the locust of the, of the biblical symbol of this pestilence. Uh, and also in Pearl Buck's famous novel, The Good Earth, the high point of which is the <coughs> destruction of the peasant village by the locusts. Well, there's a flip side. You know, history is always full of texture, always contrast. At the same time that many Americans vilify communist China, other Americans are fascinated with China, and particularly revolutionary Mao China. And that included. Uh, famous African American uh, uh, activists and writers and intellectuals, including the most famous being this man here. Who is, do you know who he is? Pardon me? Uh, w. E. B. Du Bois. So you may know the name, and I think he's probably the, maybe the greatest American intellectual of the 20th century. Phenomenal writer and thinker who <coughs> uh, wrote history, sociology, politics philosophy, and poetry, I mean, he, uh, he was the first black uh, PhD from Harvard, I think first black, and um, was uh, a uh, fighter his whole life. And at his, uh, in 1960 or so, he got fed up with the United States, he renounced his American citizenship, and moved to Ghana and became a Ghanaian. Yeah, sure. Just to interrupt you briefly, we have a graduate student, Marquitas Presswood, who's in China now doing research on uh, black nationalism in Africa and yeah, China. And Du Bois' visits to China are a big part of yeah. the project. That's a great yeah, subject. Looking forward to seeing yeah. the work. So a number of them went to China. Perhaps the most famous on his 80th occasion to celebrate his 80th birthday in 
two around that time, gave speeches. He wrote his longest poem, about pages long, China about the rise of China and his hope to see the Chinese people and the African people march hand in hand into an anti-imperialist, anti-racist world. But then, I like this photo very much because Mao looks remarkably genial here and relaxed, usually sort of stuffy and stiff and maybe <laughs> arrogant at times or just you know, somewhere else and just thinking of a foreign guest. But here he's really looking, there's some interesting talk going on in this. I, I don't know, maybe the transcript some, someday you'll get you can find this stuff. And here he is with his wife Shirley Gray and Du Bois at the National Day celebration October 1st on top of ten on the bill of skate here, standing next to Deng Xiaoping, Zhou Enlai, and Mao Zedong. You can't get much closer to <laughs> power than that. <laughs> and there's something really to get fascinating. So this is this fascination with revolutionary China, again, as a particular, uh, something of particular importance for their different African American destiny. And you know who this is? I'm glad you don't. <laughs> but this is Huey Newton, our founder of Blackpink. Uh, and he, he goes to China like this. And I was in China at the same time, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and if anyone studied Huey Newton, a lot of Huey Newton's thinking and aphorisms are really reworkings of Mao's quotes. <clears throat> anyway, Mao dies, 76, China goes through another transformation, Deng Xiaoping rises, the China market revolution comes, America now celebrates again, or mainstream America celebrates, we're going to have capitalism back in China, or possibilities of selling, as one businessman said at the time, think about it, one billion armpits in need of deodorant. <laughs> That's the way a businessman thinks. Uh, and this is, again, inexhaustible. We have a China market. Deodorant, lipstick, or toothpaste, or shoes, or something like this. And this is, again, the inspiration of the history. Now to end, uh, sort of at the beginning. Uh, who's this? show up again with a parade of celebrities on the red carpet. And you all knew who those people were. <laughs> 20 years from now, you've never, we don't even remember their names, but you know his name. Christopher Columbus. And where is he? Where is the statue? Hmm. San Francisco, Court Tower, Telegraph Hill. What is Christopher Columbus doing in San Francisco? <laughs> I mean, does he get, get close to North America? You know, I mean, he bumps into base near you know, Cuba down there. And for the rest of his life, he came back to the New World three times in total. To and to his dying day, Columbus thought he had made his way to Asia. And people said, Chris, you got it wrong. You got it wrong. You, you miscalculated the circumference of the globe. It's one third bigger than what you figured. So he thought he, did, he took out the he took out the new world, and basically the latitude is roughly the same as where he landed his Hispaniola with the Philippines and Indonesia to serve down there. But he Columbus thought he made it all the way around, and it was Columbus Day, which is Monday. Uh, but this was given to San Francisco by the uh, Italian American community, and. Um, something like one of their own, even though Columbus sailed from Spain, and in his hand, he's got his charter here, his mandate. And on his scabbard, here is our words that we often are quoted on Columbus. He does have some aphorisms and quotations from uh, Captain Columbus, and they go by, the, go by this. Go to the east, capital E, by way of the west. We've had quite an epic, very, very cool state. Vision. Go to the east, capital of the riches of the Far East, by way of the West. Not not go to the east by way of the east, which is how Europeans have been going from Marco Polo you know, before, going to the Far East. Go overland, go by water route, it's perilous and long. And he said, I got a better idea. Which sounds like a commercial. I got a better idea. Is that Ford or something like that? And you go around the world this way to the new world and find the new world. But this is when the world changes. You know, I mean, really finding the new world. 
but Columbus does this, and, and this is my, my, my suggestion here, is evidence, again, of this, this sense, this feeling, the sentiment of the urge, of the desire to capture the meat by Americans. It's part of our view that we think of our future, of our destiny, of our entwined destiny, of our destiny entwined with that of Asia. And he's looking towards the Golden Gate, toward the sunset, towards Asia. <laughs> Any of you been to Sacramento? Good. You've been to the State Capitol building? <laughs> no? You should go to the State Capitol building? Because this is what you'll see. The rotunda, beautiful, it's a rotunda. And but who's in the middle of this rotunda? In the State Capitol building. Like California. Not native peoples. Who else would we honor? Who else might we honor? You and me, I think, you know, remember Sarah might be there or something like that. No, it's Isabella and Christopher Holmes. Again, in the late 19th century donation in marble. Again, think about California. Here we are, California. But it's all about this historic vision. Well, I was in Hong Kong, Macau this summer, and I went finally to the place I've been going to for years. And Temple in Macau, which was a Portuguese colony at the time, which was the site of the first signing of the treaty between China and the United States. And I think Chinese don't have quite the same fascination of America as the American town of China, but there's still a particular sort of uh, interest and sentiment towards the United States. But you see this in this historic temple here, or this maintained temple, where the first formal treaty between the United States and China was signed. <coughs> And you can see this here in a marker, historical marker, in Chinese Portuguese. It was cool to go to Macau and read Portuguese. And English and Japanese. And this is the modest table where a Chinese official had come all the way from Peking to sign this treaty with in 1844. And sitting next across the table was a man named Caleb Cushing. From the New England area, Cushing is the big blue blood name. Again, another example of this interesting uh, connection of people, places, and history for all period of time. So, thanks for your uh, interest, and we have some time for discussion. throw out a general question that I'm sure you've thought about, and I just wondered how you would think through it. There's a kind of ebb and flow between fears and hopes about Japan and China. And so some of the China bashing we see is reminiscent of old China bashing, some of it's a Japan bashing, and I'm just wondering how you think of the, about the different places that China and Japan have in the American imagination, in this kind of entwinement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you know, one could think about, well, a lot of things I've said about China in different episodes. One could say about the relationship between the United States and, say, Russia, a particularly fraught relationship. And, and this is an interesting issue for the story. All of us, you know, you look at the relationship between Russia and what people think of Putin and all this today. I mean, it sounds like a Cold War, but, you know, there's no more communist. I mean, they're not the Soviet Union anymore. Uh, but they still got sort of the same feeling. Uh, or, and the other one might be uh, Japan. India, nor remain the as close to the same type of uh, intricate emotional relationship. Uh, and so much of what I said, or the encounter between China and the United States could be said about Japan. But the difference is, is that the, the, the interlude or the encounter with China in this intense period is much shorter, I think, than with China. China, China really stretched it out. Mm -hmm the very beginning to today. And Japan, you're absolutely right, in the 1980s, uh, 15 years or so, both ends here, we had a very other period in the, in the relationship, and many of the similar tropes and resolving uh, that and fears about Japan and the racial imagery. But then that's sort of just decline. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether Japan will ever return to uh, be a fixation 
I, I sort of doubt. I, I've, been, I've been astounded by, by Japan's decline over the past 30 years. I, I've never thought of it. There's no seem to be end in sight. It's just shocking to me, which I don't quite know. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think that's in the, in the future for you. I mean, if anything, the relation between the US and China could become more fraud. And this is, and I think, indefinite. Uh, I don't see, contrary to what the unfortunate counterpart that I have as my name, Who's Peter Navarro's buddy? <laughs> There's a man named Gordon G. Chang <laughs> who writes uh, who wrote a book on the coming collapse of China, which was his uh, prognosis uh, prediction, but also his hope. Uh, I, I, I don't have the same similar view, but he wrote this back in 2000. He saw China collapse about 2005, 2006. It didn't happen. But he keeps predicting it's going to happen. Now, he can, he can make that prediction given an argument that you think there's so much instability and weakness and so forth in China. We can make a part about the problems of China, the serious, serious problems. But he also marries that with a hope and an aspiration. He would like to see the collapse of China. And I think that's <coughs> beyond, I think, responsible journalism. But he can for Fox News and so forth uh, quite a bit. Um, so I, 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 I don't see any sign that the PRC certainly don't hope for it. And, I, and I, I've given talks like this before, and people say, well, yeah, but look how terrible China is and human rights, the treatment, and South China Sea Road, and all, I, yeah, I agree, I get it. I mean, true, true, a lot of terrible things going on. But tell me this, do you want to see the People's Republic of China collapse? Do you know, do you have any sense of what that would be for the world if China would, the government Civil war, you could be civil war, you could have bloodletting, you could see, you're going to have just chaos, you're going to have economic discipline. And then they stop, you know. So, yeah, we can be critical, but are you, but people who think, yeah, let's just go in and nuke them or get rid of them or undermine them or something, no, I, I don't have that attitude. I mean, I think we got state, which is a city, it's like enjoying destinies. Whether we like it or not, we're going to find a way, as somebody King said, you know, to get along somehow. And that, I think, is in both people's I think both people know it. Both governments know it. Uh, and that's, but this is a challenge because they're both really powerful entities, obviously. And there are a lot of serious problems. But I think that's more of my, my particular perspective. Uh, in uh, modern world history, uh, oh, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, the, a new rising superpower often could not get along with uh, the existing of the one. You, know, you look at the history of uh, Spain, uh, Germany, Japan, and so on and so forth. So if China continues to rise, uh, would a conflict with the US, uh, economic or military, uh, would that kind of uh, conflict be uh, inevitable? Yeah, well, that's, of course, the political scientists talk about this as a dilemma, and Hillary Clinton and Obama talk about this in the first administration. And this is, this is what history suggests is inevitable, and some political scientists in international relations say that you have now a change in the international system with the rise of the status quo power, a hegemonic status quo power challenged by rising power, and inevitably you have, you have some sort of sort, sort out, sort of sort, sorting out of, of power and relationships. Powers, France, and so forth, and then World War II with, with uh, Germany and Japan. So the, these were all the same. But there are many other instances, or even with the United States and Spanish American War and Spain, these are all seen as a kind of wars similar to each other. Uh, great powers fighting it out to redistribute the power, re readjust the, the de facto uh, 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 power relations. Um, I'm not a political scientist. I don't want to predict about the future. I certainly would not want to see that happen. But, uh, and I don't want to be too facetious, but I'll put it this way, maybe a humorous way. Uh, is it possible for two countries to have Disneyland's to go to war? <laughs> um, see, there is a political science theory that says democracies don't go to war. I don't write big, very 
various departments. So I say, well, maybe countries with Disneyland won't go to war. <laughs> because, you know, Disneyland represents all sorts of economic and cultural power. And uh, you know, maybe that's going to be as persuasive as saying the two systems in which you have representative governments uh, don't go to power. You heard it here first. That's a new theory. <laughs> <laughs> that's really exciting. That's tweetable. Yes. You know, I want to blog that no. Jeff tweetable. Really Christine's really live tweeting. I'm sure it's already done. <laughs> that, yeah, I should have that here. It's free. Uh, but I was really thinking about that with, with, with Disney and China. Yeah. Yeah. It's a joint venture. Yeah. A lot of the money actually came from China. Uh, you know, there are 340 million people, it is said, who live within three hours of Shanghai. 340, as many people in America <laughs> within a car ride of Shanghai. But how many of those people can afford to actually? A lot of them. Yeah. Well, because this is the richest area in China. Yeah. This is smack dab. In, 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 uh, like yeah, and you go, you go there, many people, maybe it's, it's astounding. You see the houses, the business districts, the factories, you go on and on, roughly from, well, in this, in this, in this geographic. This is really, uh, and the other big area would be southern China near Canton, but, but this is mm -hmm. market much more. Some Shanghai residents, I think, got free uh, passes also. Free passes. Yeah. Oh, some, really? not, not all. Yeah, some, yeah. Well, he actually had local, local, you know, local rates, just like this here, <laughs> 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 and all that. But, um, you know, that's so both Obama and, and Clinton said that, that they wanted to history, they don't want history to repeat itself, but we're not going to have a new history. And also Xi Jinping said that same thing, that we're not going to repeat, we're not going to find a different path. Mm -hmm. Now, is that possible? Hopefully that will defy that. I mean, this past this five, six years, unfortunately, I think it's not validated or supported their hopes. Maybe they haven't pursued it the way they said they were some months ago. It's pretty tough. I mean, it's, not, it's not pretty right now. So uh, we'll, we'll have to see. I, uh, sort of along the lines of what you're saying, uh, and how I started out saying, I, I don't think that uh, despite what, what Trump and others say is about the, the fearing of the decline of America, the loss of the American hegemony, the toppling of the US as the top dog, and so forth, I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, with the, uh, the irony, if you want to call it that, of America right now, despite, I mean, there are a lot of people with terrible grievances, it's true, and there are a lot of terrible, but you think about it as, as, as an economic, as a Global power. The United States today has more power, but exponential factors than any other great power in history. Maybe the Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire had to be able to shy away from here. There's no more no incomparable to the United States right now. There's no more Soviet Union. There's no more you know, nuclear a nuclear weapon, despite what Trump says at all that was Russia's would you rather have New York, U.S. nukes or Soviet nukes? And the systems that go with the knowledge. I mean, I mean, anyway, any military person is <coughs> military force is uh, awesome, awesome. <laughs> it's so scary. I mean, it is, it's beyond our, our, I mean, most of our belief. We didn't know what they We know a little bit what can be done. We see the war as being prosecuted, I mean, you know, these, these drones and strikes and all like this, and cyber warfare. I mean, it's it, the amount of money we pay as taxes to go with. You know, it's, it's, it's huge. And China's never going to come close to it. It'd be so stupid. I mean, China knows it's never going to compete with the United States in, in nuclear weapons competition. It would just drain, drain it. You think about language we're talking about. You think about cultural power. Well, China's got the mermaids, movie. Yeah. <laughs> mermaids. Yeah. Stephen Chow. Yeah. yeah. So, the movie, a big blockbuster, very popular movie. And, in, Ch in China, the mermaids, you know, got some traction here in the United States, but not like The Martian, you know, Infinity, Interstellar, on and on and on. I mean, these Amer American these movies, I mean, they're amazing. I'm not talking about the context, but in terms of the traction, you think about what else you're talking about? Kobe Bryant. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many kids in China who got little boys and named Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> and you go into rooms, and you, you go uh, to college a few years ago, and you see pictures of Kobe Bryant. 
and people want Air Jordan and all that stuff. Uh, so culture, you know, sports power, it is big. I mean, who, who, who put together the, 19, the, the 2008 Olympics? State of China was in Beijing. But who put it on? It was American, you know, uh, uh, companies. NBA, the people who put these mega things on, who else in the world can do those things? It's actually American companies that were contracted to put a lot of staging. I mean, amazing technical problems of how to organize these things. You know, not the fireworks in the laboratory, but how to work for the world organizes them. They talk about fashion, popular culture, you know, Korean popular culture, Japanese popular culture, America. But then you got Beyonce and Jay Z and all these people. You know, so on and on. The American power, any type of measure you want to use, hard power, economic power, or military power, soft power, whatever you want to call it, no one comes close. Economic power, yes. China is a clear economic power. And it may it actually, uh, but when you think about power of these two countries, people also all oh, this, this match. But what do you really want to match? Here's China over here. Here's the United States over here. If you want to make it a dichotomy, who's over here as an ally? My first book, Friends and Allies. Who's an ally in the United States? Britain, France, Germany, Japan, Italy, Spain, NATO, the Philippines. Who's over here? North Korea. <laughs> Burma. <laughs> Not even Vietnam. North Korea, <laughs> anytime soon this is going to change. I mean, you think of the economic military bloc led by the United States. It's four or five times over here. And so I think it's another sort of global way of, of thinking. Of, yes, the United States is, is, is not as preeminent as it was in some ways. And China is really sore. But from, from my point of view, I think that they, there's no real and I think if the Chinese leaders, if they don't get blinded by some delusion, you know, I have to understand this. If you're serious in thinking about how to be in a country, you want to have a secure future, you don't have a lot. If you want to challenge the United States, so this is the dilemma of the Chinese. Yeah, they do in some sense. Some Chinese see they want some this, they want some that, they want to exert some power here. But do they have an aspiration? Uh, replacing the United States as a global headquarter. I don't think they have a lot of responsibility. <laughs> they got so many problems at home. Well, some people say, well, to deal with the problems at home, they're going to get all these we you know, because they get all the national That was something about that. But yeah, you can't solve long-term problems. Yeah, well, just you mentioned the blockchain and everything. I'm wondering if there more of a proxy conflict in the sense of like China attempting to gain influence in Africa and Southeast Asia, for example. Unquestionably. Um, Unquestionably. Yeah. I mean, they want economic influence, they want also diplomatic influence. Mm -hmm. And I think the issue in Africa is, is very interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. it isn't driven principally, exclusively by economic interests, looking for oil. Mm -hmm. South Sudan, manufacturing, uh, manufacturing markets, mm -hmm. Chinese goods going on there. Um, so surely that's part of it. And, and a lot there are, I don't know, maybe Jeff knows how many Chinese are living in Africa? A million? Or, I mean, I mean of estimates have been a million, yeah, but yeah, more. Yeah. I mean, a million was the kind of base. Yeah, I mean, but the Chinese investments over there is 10 times bigger than that of the US. So the Chinese are going over there, and you know, again, China. Whoop, whoop. Uh, we we easily use the, the uh, collective term China. China is in Africa. Well, there are Chinese in Africa. Right. There are right. Chinese business people. There right. are Chinese workers. A lot, a lot of these million over there are workers. Right. So do you think it's more economic and less political? Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to talk, talk about that. I don't know enough. It's changing all the time. And some people say it's more destiny. And some of the Chinese will point to that it's not just economic. You know, they really do have, going back to Du Bois, who, who hoped to see the African and the Chinese people merge together. And, and maybe this is only rhetorical, but the Chinese also have a certain, you know, at least nod to 
with this idea of being connected historically to mm -hmm. the colonial side. Mm -hmm. We're running a little short on time, so I'm going to take the prerogative to ask the last question. <laughs> um, it sounds like you see an ongoing intensification of the conflict between the US and China. And I was thinking about the editorial that I opened up with and this man's question, you know, will my daughters mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. always have this feeling of being outsiders, of being foreigners, of being friends? And so I'm wondering, I know you don't want to make predictions because you're a historian, but what do you think? And do you think that the condition, the position of Chinese America will always be that of the outsider, especially since there's ongoing tensions between the US and China? Um, always is a long period of time. majority non-white undergraduate. I still kind of understand that. The majority non-white, Asian, black, and for an elite institution to confront the alumni who came from a Stanford of a very different place, and they come back to campus and they look around and say, where, where am I? You know, I don't see my nephew didn't get my you know, my kids don't get it. But you let these people in. You know, people talk like that. And I think it's to the credit of a lot of institutions in the United States to have changed almost, you know, certainly could have prepared. And most clearly, you know, President Obama or something. Whatever your politics are, I mean he's an admirable man and respectful and a smart person. And he is roughly the same generation as I mean younger than I But this is this is, you know, I think was Unthinkable when I was in college, in your age, to think, oh, 30 years from now, we have a black president. Well, we just killed Martin Luther King when I was in college. And now I'm going to have to follow you a few numbers. So things can change. Do you have some my hopeful note? <laughs> 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 Please join me in thanking Professor Chen. Okay. Outside.